All right, well, thank you. Uh, so I'm excited to be here today with you. So this is a bit uh, different audience than, than I'm used to speaking to. We talked to a lot of, uh, of our users, and uh, so not as much uh, in, in the H2O side. So we're, we're excited to be here. Um, so just to kind of get a quick poll, how many of you are using R currently? OK, wow, good amount. And, and how many of you are using Spark? A few. OK, great. Excellent. All right, well, I'll introduce both, uh, just for anyone who's unfamiliar. But R, uh, I suspect you're mostly aware, uh, is an is a incredible language for data analysis and statistical computing, visualization, all these kinds of things. Um, in terms of the latest EEE poll, it's actually the fifth most popular language in the world, uh, which was surprising to me. But, uh, but it's, it's certainly taken off in popularity. Um, it, our, our pitch is that it's a really incredible interface to your data. So if you have data, R is really the easiest way to work with that data uh, in terms of you know, a programming interface. The, the one nuance of R, though, is that historically it's been limited to in-memory data. Uh, and so if you have four gigs of RAM, you can analyze a three to three and a half gig data set, uh, and that was kind of your cap there. Um, so what I want to talk about today is kind of how we're going to overcome that and uh, how we have overcome that with uh, using Spark and some other tools. Uh, so Spark, if you're unfamiliar, is an open source computing platform. Uh, it handles distributed data. It also handles distributed computation. Uh, and so you can handle bigger than memory data. And, and typically what happens is you distribute your data across a large cluster that has a bunch more RAM than your laptop might. Uh, but then you can also do low latency computing on top of that. So you can do you know, low, like sub-second queries on, on some of this data to, to interact with these massive data sets. Uh, and it Hadoop integrates well with the Hadoop ecosystem. So if you're already using Hadoop, uh, you can certainly get onto Spark pretty quickly. Uh, and it has built-in machine learning, which is one of the more interesting pieces here for our sake, is that now not only is your data distributed, but you can also leverage distributed uh, machine learning frameworks when, when your data is housed in Spark. So we'll talk about some of these today. So we want to introduce Sparkly R. Uh, so Sparkly R is a package, it's an open source package that's created by RStudio, uh, and it allows you to interact between R and Spark. Uh, it's a complete dplyr backend for uh, Spark. And if you don't understand what that means, I'll explain it here momentarily. Uh, but it is now integrated with the RStudio IDE. So if you download the latest preview of the RStudio IDE, you'll notice this new tab here, the Spark tab. You click on that tab, and it'll help you connect to your Spark cluster. It'll help you uh, view your Spark data sets and all these kinds of things. So uh, again, I'll show you some more of those here in a moment. Uh, and what's really exciting here is that it's an extensible foundation for Spark and R. So that means that if your organization has already written custom Scala extensions for some of the work that you want to do in Spark, or if you want to use a platform like H2O uh, and, and leverage their work that they've already done in, in our Sparkling or in Sparkling Water uh, to be able to, to tap into some of the, some of the existing Spark uh, infrastructure that you already have, you're now able to do that using Spark there as well. So I'll show you all these momentarily. So. Um, I'll confess up front that I, I'm kind of an imposter here. So I'm a software engineer. I'm not a, a data scientist by training. And I actually wasn't uh, one of the core members of the, of the Spark AR team. But one of the things that I think is most exciting about the work that they've done, uh, obviously, first of all, that it's now a bridge between R and Spark. But the other real contribution that I think they've made in the space is that, in my opinion, this is the easiest onboarding experience to Spark. So if you have not tried out Spark yet, if you're just kind of curious and you're wanting to play around with it, I would encourage you to try out Sparkly R primarily just because it's the easiest on-ramp to, to get into Spark. And I've tried it through Python. I've tried it to, through Scala. Um, and, and I think this is the easiest way to get started for sure. So this is all it takes. You, you install the package. You run the Spark install command. That'll go get you everything that you need to run Spark. That'll go get you all the Spark libraries, the Hadoop libraries, whatever you need. It'll provision it for you and, and set it all up. Uh, and then now what we can do is we can connect. And so right here, we're running a local cluster. Of course, you can run this in production and connect to your real Spark cluster when you have that. Uh, but if you're just wanting to kick the tires, then just run it locally. And this is going to set up a real full-fledged Spark environment running on your local machine. Uh, and so you can see down here at the bottom that we have, uh, you know, this is the executor. That You've got your master. You've got your slave. This is the real Spark environment. You're not, you're not lacking anything here. Uh, and then now what we can do, this is just something that we'll do kind of for the proof of concept, but we're going to copy some data in from R into Spark. Now, traditionally, if you already have your data in R, then of course there's not a whole lot of value in you bringing it into Spark because it already must have fit in memory for you to have it in R in the first place. Uh, but this is a great way to just kind of you know, get some data into Spark and start playing around with it. So uh, I mentioned that I would come back to the dplyr point. Uh, so if you haven't touched dplyr before, it, it's kind of a new way of interacting with your data, uh, but I find that it's, it's a incredibly uh, lucrative way to do it, and it's, it's a much more efficient way to, to interact with data. So dplyr is an open source R package, again, also created by our studio. 
Uh, and the idea is that they have this very small surface area of how you might want to interact with your data. And so when you want to select and you want to filter and these kind of basic SQL operations, uh, it just gives you verbs in, in R that allow you to do that a little more quickly and gracefully. Uh, so here you can see we're, we're doing this, uh, we're going to take this my table uh, table that we just created, and you've kind of got to read this from the inside out the way it's currently written. Uh, so we take this my table variable, we're going to filter on that variable uh, to include only those rows where the pedal width is less than 0.3. So, okay, so now we've taken a, a smaller, you know, chunk of our data. Uh, and then we're only going to select a couple of columns out of that resultant data. And so we're going to select the pedal length and pedal width from that table. So now we've filtered and then we've selected to, to shrink the table. And now we just have two variables and you know, fewer rows than we originally had because they've been filtered. So the other way to write this, uh, you may find this a little bit uh, unintuitive to read that from the inside out. So the other way to write this is using Magritter pipes. Um, and if you haven't seen this before, it can be kind of jarring the first time that you encounter it. But what's important to realize is these are the exact same. These are doing the exact same thing. And so I'm going to show you uh, some of my code is going to involve these pipes. Uh, th there's nothing magical about them. It's just another way to write the R code that, in my mind, makes it a little bit more readable and a little bit more elegant. So if you haven't seen this before, don't be thrown off by it. This isn't some you know, new version of R or anything like that. This is just a different way to write this, the exact same code. So the way you read this, we usually translate those pipes, the percent greater than percent. We usually call, read those then. So you'd say my table, then filter, then select. And you get the exact same result. All right. So let me show you what this actually looks like. Uh, and the font is a little small. Bump this up. Are you able to read that in the back? All right. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to be using a new feature that's available in the RStudio preview. If you haven't seen this yet, there's a new thing called RStudio Notebooks. Um, and, and these are actually pretty exciting. Uh, so if you've seen our markdown before, it's, it's kind of the same idea that you're taking, uh, you know, prose and you're interleaving it with text, right? This is the pretty common uh, notebook metaphor. Um, what's interesting, though, is that it, traditionally in our markdown, uh, this was a static compilation. So we had the document, and then you clicked compile, and at some point in time, it would create the artifact for you. Uh, now, in the newer, newest version of our studio, you have notebooks. Um, which will actually interleave the output as you're creating the document, which is kind of neat. So you'll see that happening here, uh, and that's just a feature that's available in, in the newer versions of our studio. So, all right, so basically what we've done first is we've loaded some packages, uh, and then again, I'm connecting to a local Spark cluster, and then I'm, I'm copying some data in uh, just via read CSV. Again, it, in production, you're probably not going to be responsible for creating the data through R. You're, you're going to have that data in existence already. But once I've done that, you can see that now in my Spark tab over here, uh, I have the NYPD data set. Uh, and so this is that data set that I created. You can go in and you can preview the columns. Uh, we can actually just take a look at what that table uh, would look like, and it'll grab a f the first few rows for us, and we can kind of take a gander at the different columns that are available and the different rows and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so again, this data is all housed in Spark. None of this is in memory in R. Um, and so again, if you have a massive production cluster, this could be a petabyte data set, and you know, there, there's no problem with that at all. All right. So we've got our NYPD data over here in Spark, and now we're going to start interacting with it. Uh, so again, I'm going to use this dplyr strategy. I'm going to take my data. I'm going to filter it down to just include or exclude those missing rows. So if you don't have a latitude or a longitude, if you, uh, you know, are missing some data there, uh, then we'll get rid of that. Uh, and then we're going to arrange it, uh, just sort it, basically. OK? And so what's happening behind the scenes here, if, you've, if you haven't used dplyr before, uh, dplyr is, is actually just a way to generate SQL. Uh, and so you can use it with Spark, and it's going to generate Spark-compatible SQL. You could also use this with SQL Server or MySQL or Postgres or whatever you want to use, uh, Red, uh, Redshift and Bigtable and all those, the cloud providers work as well. Uh, and so basically what's happening here is I'm just generating SQL that's, that's eventually going to be executed against my database. And so you can see here, this is the SQL that was generated. Uh, and again, uh, I personally, I guess there are probably some SQL gurus out there, but I personally find this much more readable uh, than you know, these, these nested queries and things in SQL. And certainly once you get a little more complicated, it, it becomes even more uh, intuitive to, to use dplyr there. So, and then it even shows you the evaluation plan uh, from the database of how they're, gonna actually, how they're actually going to execute this, the uh, query. All right, so we've got, our, we've got a new uh, reference to that variable uh, in, in, in R now. Uh, again, that didn't copy the data into R, but it's just uh, prepared kind of what that data is going to look like in R. Is there a question? Nope, okay. All right, uh, and so now what we're gonna do is we're going to uh, use this SDF partition function uh, that's available in Sparkly R. 
Uh, and so one of the things that, uh, that I hadn't mentioned yet is that Sparkly R actually is a complete wrapper in R for all of the machine learning and all of the feature transformers uh, that are available in Spark. Uh, and so that had not existed in R until Sparkly R. So you can use all of these, uh, all of the, the existing uh, functionality that you're used to in Spark here from R now. Uh, and so what this does, and, and if, you're, if you're new to Spark, this is actually, I don't know of a way to do this in R to, to do a, a split between training and test data in a single line. Um, so this is just kind of a convenient function. But, but again, this is going to keep it all remote. This is all, all my data still lives in Spark. I haven't downloaded any of it, uh, but I'm going to split it between training and testing. And so 90% training, 10% testing. Uh, I'm going to execute that. Uh, and now I'm just going to store these, these uh, references uh, to be a little more convenient. Uh, and now I'm going to run a decision tree against uh, this data. And again, this is using the, the ML underscore indicates that this is a Spark function. So this is the Spark ML library running a decision tree. And so again, none of the data is on my laptop. This could be gigabytes, terabytes of data out in, the, out in Spark. Um, and none of, that, none of that matters to me. Um, OK, so we've built a decision tree. And now uh, I'm just going to do some, this is just kind of some munging that, that we have to do currently. I think in a, in a future version, we'll, we'll get rid of some of this. But it's probably not worth going through the code. But basically, what ends up happening here is that we, we get uh, on our prediction, on our test set, uh, we get 62,000 classified correctly and 66,000 classified incorrectly. And what I'm doing here is I built a decision tree that's predicting the bureau uh, that an accident occurred given the latitude and longitude of that accident. So this should be pretty intuitive, right? You would, you would assume that there are pretty tight boundaries around what defines a bureau in New York, uh, and, and that you would get the latitude and longitude there uh, that, to be able to predict that pretty well. And so indeed, it looks like our decision tree was able to do that correctly, and so that's great. And I didn't really introduce the data set very well. I probably should have. This is uh, all of the automobile accidents that have occurred in the NYPD jurisdiction since, I think, 2013, 2014. Um, and so, you know, thousands and thousands of accidents, hundreds of thousands of accidents. Um, it's not really big data in the Spark sense, right? I think this is like 600 megs or 300 megs or something. Um, but, you know, big enough to, to kind of prove our points. So, all right. So we have uh, created a decision tree that seems to work pretty well. Uh, and so now I'm just going to download some of that data now. So I'm just downloading the test data set. So this is just 10% of my data, which it turns out since this data is small enough that I can do that pretty feasibly and that'll fit in memory. And you know, I don't have to worry about that. But again, you know, up to this point, I have not downloaded any set of memory or any set of data into memory. Uh, and now I'm going to run that into ggplot. And so uh, when we run that through ggplot, you can see these are all the uh, accidents that we, in our test set, that we classified. Uh, and you can see kind of the clusterings here that, you know, you've got Brooklyn and the Bronx, and uh, you can kind of see these boundaries here that where, uh, you know, it's, it's predicting the Bureau based on the latitude and longitude of the accident. Uh, or if, if maybe more meaningfully, we can just look and see which classifications uh, were guessed correctly or which ones were incorrect. And so you can see these few red points. I don't know how well they show up on the projector. Uh, but there are a few red points down here where it got the classification wrong, right on these boundaries here. It's, it's kind of prone to have a few errors there. So you can see, you know, that's, that's where the problem exists in our decision tree. But overall, pretty good results and, uh, you know, pretty accurate uh, for, for a very simple ML problem, but pretty accurate results there. So that is what it feels like to use Spark there. Uh, again, this is all me running it locally on my laptop. Of course, you would run this in production uh, typically. And so basically what would happen is you just install RStudio server on an edge node on your Spark cluster, uh, and then you would just be able to interact with it there. Uh, if you're not aware, RStudio exists both locally as a desktop application and remotely as a server application. Uh, the interface is the exact same. It's just whether you access it through a browser or locally on your desktop. All right. Uh, and this is what it would look like to, to connect to your cluster. If you weren't using local mode, you would just pass in the URL of the Spark cluster uh, and then, again, start downloading data from it. OK. So in summary, SparkLayer offers you full DeepLayer backend for Spark data frames. So now you can use DeepLayer with Spark, just like you've used DeepLayer with any other database system. Uh, we have R wrappers for all of the ML lib functions. There's none missing. So anything that you can do in, in terms of ML or feature transformers in Spark, you can do in R. You can easily leverage all this from R Markdown in Chiny. There's nothing, you know, there's no new framework here. It's just, you're just running R. Uh, it does have integration with the IDE, so you can kind of explore it interactively there. Uh, and we also support Windows, which uh, if you've tried to do Spark on your own in Windows, you may have found it a, a, a bit painful. But now the, the examples that I showed earlier of just running Spark install and getting it run, running locally, all of that actually works on Windows as well. So um, feel free to download it and try it out there. One of the more exciting things, especially to this audience, is that now because the platform is extensible, we have partners who are coming in and integrating some of their uh, Spark work into, Sparkly R, into the Sparkly R platform. 
And so uh, H2O has done this work, and they've created a package called R Sparkling, which is an R interface into uh, Sparkling Water, which is their Spark library uh, for the H2O uh, machine learning stuff. Uh, and so this is available as a, as a Sparkler extension. They've made it open source, and it's all uh, you know, right there online available for you. Uh, and I'll show you quickly this website. So I'll give you this link at the end here, but uh, spark.rstudio.com is the best resource for getting more information on these things. Uh, and if you go into the ML tab, you'll find the H2O link, and that'll show you exactly the steps that you do uh, to get H2O set up with uh, Sparkly R. And then uh, as soon as you have that, you have all of these functions available to you, all the algorithms that they've made available through our Sparkling. Um, you can now use built on the Sparkly R platform. Um, and some really great, you know, really rich ecosystem uh, that you're familiar with with H2O now is available through uh, R on the Spark platform. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'll just show a bit of this. I'll just leave it running while I start talking. I'm not going to show the whole thing. Uh, but this is just an example. I, I didn't uh, want to uh, predicate myself on the Wi-Fi quality. But uh, this is an example of running a 200 gigabyte analysis, uh, or an analysis on a 200 gigabyte data set. This is using that NYC taxi uh, data that you may have seen, uh, at, you know, seen a few blog posts about. Um, but basically, this is like all the taxi drives, all the taxi trips in, in New York City from you know, a few years ago or something like that. Um, and so it shows, uh, you can see here that we've loaded that data into Spark. Uh, you can see uh, that we're you know, previewing the data and we can look at the data here. Um, and so this video is gonna go through, and we, we actually have all this on the, on the spark.rstudio.com website, so you're, you're free to follow along or download the code with it. Um, but this will show you exactly how to, uh, you know, how we would do an analysis on a much bigger data set, 200 gigs, but it's using the exact same functions and the exact same pat uh, patterns that we set up previously. So. Um, Anyways, I'll let, you, uh, I'll let you watch that on, on your own time here since we're running a little short. But uh, this all works. So this is on a cluster of uh, five, uh, five servers uh, out, in, out in Amazon. But, so uh, if you have used Spark and R before, uh, you, you might have used the Spark R package. And so I just wanted to address kind of the relationship there. So uh, we're working together with the Databricks folks to try to establish a common extension API so that we're kind of all building on the same platform. Um, but fundamentally, the difference between Spark R and Sparkly R is basically just kind of a difference in approach. Um, and so we're, we are uh, emphasizing the ability to distribute this package on CRAN. They have not. Um, and, and also, we want full-fledged dplyr compatibility rather than being dplyr-like, which is kind of how they've uh, described themselves. And so just to kind of drive that point home, so when you load Spark R, um, this is kind of the message that you see. And you'll see that it's basically... Uh, it kind of mimics a lot of these functions that you're familiar with, either from dplyr or from other packages, but it's not actually using those functions. And so you may find some differences in behavior, especially around like whether or not column names should be quoted for dplyr variables, things like that. Um, and so you may find it a little bit complicated to try to use Spark R if you're familiar with dplyr. Um, and so we went kind of a different route and said we want, we want a real first-class citizen in the dplyr ecosystem, and we just want to make Spark compatible with that. Um, and so you should find no you know, dissonance between using dplyr with Spark and dplyr with, with any other uh, endpoint uh, if you're using Sparkly R. Uh, so again, I'd encourage you to go to spark.rstudio.com. We've got all sorts of different examples of how you could use this in a dashboard setting, how you can use this in a Shiny application or in interactive widgets, and different things like that. Um, but you know, all of these are, are certainly available to you um, because again, this is just an R package, it's just our code, so everything that you're, you're accustomed to in the R ecosystem is now available to you through Spark and Sparkly R. At that point, I'd be happy to take questions. So uh, using Sparkly R, would it allow me to um, overcome the memory limitation that R has? So yeah. would, would Spark that overflow to my disk yeah. when I'm out of memory? Yeah, yeah so, so the basic idea, um, <coughs> with, with Spark certainly, the expectation is that you would have a Spark cluster that's much larger than your laptop. And so if, if that's the case, then, then yeah, you would find that you can put hundreds of gigs of memory in some Spark cluster that's very large and designed for those purposes. Um, if you don't have that, then uh, yeah, Spark, Spark does allow you to kind of gracefully bring memory, or bring data in and out of memory. Um, and that's a little bit beyond the scope of, of the talk and honestly beyond the scope of my knowledge of, of how to interact with Spark. But we do have mechanisms for controlling what data you're bringing into to cache, like what data you're bringing into memory and which data you're leaving cold um, within Spark. And so all of those mechanisms are available to you. But uh, yeah, it would just be a limitation of kind of how you interact with Spark. Hey, Jeff. Uh, I've met you in the, uh, the latest R meetup yeah. which we had for Dallas. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in fact, uh, uh, I started uh, trying to mess up with Sparklier uh, once we had that meetup. Uh, 
I felt the, uh, the, the one which you installed the Spark here, even mm -hmm. though it's a stable version, I don't think so it's working. I guess so they had some fixes. Oh, okay. And I had to install it from the uh, dev tools. Oh, okay, yeah. So, so yeah, certainly, I mean, yeah. it's moved pretty quickly, so there may be some fixes in, yeah. in the GitHub repo that aren't uh, available. In fact, okay. in fact I, have, I still have some problems installing okay. some stuff. So, we can talk. Uh, uh, probably I'll get back to you uh, sure. offline you know, yep. yeah, to get talk. some stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, besides the ML li uh, machine learning libraries that are nearly av available in Spark and uh, supported, I mean, also supported by H2O, uh, what are the other packages that can work using Spark here, uh, specifically machine learning packages? Yeah, so, so H2O is the one that's advertised their extension, and then obviously all the Spark native ML stuff um, is the one that we've built. Um, so those are the two that you'll find on the website now, but there are others that are kind of working on kind of their own extensions. And a lot of these end up being a little bit more kind of independent, like bespoke. Uh, you know, some organization has some Scala code that they want to be able to use from R, and so they, you know, would make a Sparkly R extension for that. So uh, will we be able to use uh, even other packages besides ML, like the visualization packages and the uh, data, cl data cleaning packages? Uh, yeah, so the, the for the ones that are available in R, you mean? Uh, with Spark. Yeah, yeah, so, so I didn't really drive that point home, but yeah, absolutely. So um, when you, basically at this point, like what I've done, so, so I showed the example of bringing the data into ggplot, um, but if you, f let me find the command um, here. So what, I've, what I'm actually doing here is I'm saying, uh, out of all my predictions, I want these columns and then collect them, which actually means download them into R. At that point, I have a data frame in R that I can do whatever I want with. So you can do R machine learning, you can do visualization, you can create interactive graphics, you can do, like it's just R data at that point. Um, and so you always have the option of saying like, I've done some work in Spark, I've done some machine learning, I've done some classification, I've done whatever, I've done some filtering, and now like that set of data, I actually want to download locally and I want to start working with as R data. Um, yeah, so that's absolutely available to you and, and you know, at that point it's just R data, you can do whatever you want. So you mentioned with connecting to a production cluster, you would install our studio server on a node of that cluster and then interact that way. Is it possible to connect from a local version to a Spark cluster? Is it, yeah. is it preferred to do it through our studio server? What's the... Yeah, so, so yes and yes. Um, so it is possible. So the problem is that in order to run the Spark driver separately from the Spark cluster, um, those actually require, and this is just a, a quirk of Spark, they require a full duplex network communication between the two. And so if you have any sort of firewall that exists between you and that machine, you're going to find that, that you're going to have issues. Um, and so, yeah, if you're able to configure your network in such a way that that works, then, then you'd be fine. Uh, the recommended scenario, though, is just say, because you definitely you want to minimize uh, the latency and you need that full duplex communication. So for most networking environments, it's just easier to say, just set up a server next to your Spark cluster and, and use it there. So. Any questions? All right. Well, thank you.